In this tutorial, I'm going to go over the rate limiter in KMAX. I'm going to start with this default five band scenario. I'll click in the middle here to go to the network page. And what I'm going to do first off is to create a filter in this classifier. I'm going to be using the iPerf3 packet generator, and my filter is going to trigger on iPerf3 data packets. So I'll enable the classifier, add a filter. In the IP port section, I'll enable this subsection. And for packets going to a default port of 5201, I'm going to enable UDP mode. So this, this will cover UDP packets going to port 5201. I'll direct those packets to flow 1, which is right underneath the default flow. I'll rename this flow iperf3. And then I'll start my iperf3 server. Here's the server, just iperf3-s. And here's the client. So my iperf3 server shows uh, 200 packets per second with a UDP payload bitrate of 1.95 megabits per second. And the way I've set this up is that the, um, the bitrate that the rate limiter will be seeing is exactly 2 megabits per second. And if I go into the rate limiter here, you can see that the uh, packet gauge is lit up showing the packets are flowing through this band. Going into the rate limiter, I'm going to set the target bit rate to 2 megabits per second and the way the rate limiter works is whenever a packet arrives the rate limiter strips off the Ethernet headers and uses the rest in its calculation of the WAN simulation and my iperf3 client is configured so that after the 14 byte Ethernet header is removed you uh, wind up with 2 megabits per second exactly. So if I set the target rate to 2 megabits per second, that will just barely pass the packets that I pass through the rate limiter without building up any uh, packets in the input queue. I'm going to momentarily increase the input queue to a large number, and then I will enable the rate limiter. And to simplify things even more, I'm going to set the overhead bits to zero and the minimum packet size to zero and the maximum packet size to a large number. And what you'll see here is uh, a readout of the queue level. And you'll notice the queue level more or less stays about the same. It flails around about um, around 60 packets. And it's going to maintain that constant level, if we look down here at the graphical um, display, it's going to maintain about a constant level because the input rate uh, for the um, incoming packets is about equal to our target rate. If I were to set the target rate to say half, then you're going to see the number of queued packets start to increase over time. And the time that it takes to drain the input queue will also increase. And down here you can see the graphical representation. The level is increasing over time. Here I've set the queue length to a very large value, but if I were to um, set the queue length to a smaller value, like uh, 100 packets, and then, and then if I were to flush, oops, set this back to 100, you notice that the queued packets build up and then bump up against the maximum input queue size of 100, and then they will get dropped. Uh, so my iperf3 server shows that instead of the 200 packets per second arriving, only about 100 packets per second are arriving. Now I, I increase the target rate back to 2 megabits per second. Uh, we now have a situation where the packets are passing through pretty much unscathed. I'll increase the queue level to remove that from the equation. Then you can set the overhead bits and min and max packet sizes. And the way this works is that the packets that are flowing through the rate limiter have a simulated size of 10,000 bits. And that's the size that you get when the ethernet header is stripped off of the packet. 
So if I set the min and max size to 1000 bits, what happens is the rate limiter is just barely able to squeeze each incoming packet into a simulated packet of size 10,000 bits. So the packets pass through without any kind of fragmentation. Um, however, if, um, if I were to set the max, uh, min and max packet size to say 9999 for each, then what happens is an incoming packet of size 10,000 bits just barely can't fit into a 9999 bit packet and so it has to be fragmented over two packets but since the minimum size is also 9999 then basically half of the channel bandwidth is wasted and um, and you will get uh, about uh, what we see here is about half the bandwidth so instead of two megabits per second we're now down to about one megabits per second if I increase back to 10,000. Uh, similarly, if I increase the overhead bits, uh, what happens is after packetization and after possible fragmentation, the overhead bits are added to each packet and then the overhead bits consume channel bandwidth. So if I set the overhead bits equal to the packet size, then we're also going to be at about half the bit rate because in this case half of the channel is consumed by the overhead bits. If I turn the overhead bits back to zero and if I flush the queue then we can see that the uh, server receives a bandwidth back up to two megabits per second. If I reset these values to allow uh, the packets to go straight through, uh, there are other options in the rate limiter. I can tell the rate limiter to drop either the head or tail of the queue. Uh, so if I set the uh, queue length to a smaller value, um, either the last packet to enter the queue or the first packet to enter the queue will be dropped. For the rate control algorithm, you can select bit clocking your token bucket. And bit clocking is also known as reduced bandwidth link emulation. Uh, this simulates an actual WAN where um, the rate limiter will simulate what happens one bit at a time. Whereas with the token bucket, I can specify a token bucket size. And what will happen is the token bucket will constrain the output bandwidth to my target rate up here in the long term. But in the short term, bursts of data are allowed. Um, and you can have a burst as large as, uh, as large as necessary before the token bucket empties. The maximum value of the token bucket is about uh, one megabyte. And if I set the target rate to 1 megabits per second, then what we have here is a situation where the outgoing bit rate from the token bucket is 1 megabits per second, and the incoming bit, bit rate is 2 megabits per second, which means the, the token bucket is being uh, drained at the rate of about 1 megabit per second and if we only have this many bytes it'll take about eight seconds for the token bucket to drain. Uh, now what this means is if, if I press this uh, flush Q button and then look at what the iperf3 server is doing uh, we get full um, bit rate going through the rate limiter until the token bucket empties and then once the token bucket empties the bit rate goes down to our target rate. If I switch back to bit clocking, and I'm once again still at one megabit per second target rate, I can then select the uh, algorithm. Either a packet can be dropped, um, or the 
packet can be marked for random early detection. And the random early detection algorithm can either drop a packet or, if the packet allows ECN bits to be set, uh, the rate limiter can only set the ECN bits and then forward the packet. Uh, I'm going to stick with the drop mode. And basically what happens is I set a minimum and maximum Q threshold. So back up here I have my Q. And I have a very large value here, but the actual Q level is going to be determined by these numbers. Until the Q level goes up to 20, which is the minimum threshold, no drop will be applied. Once the Q reaches 40, then the maximum possible drop will be applied, and that drop percentage is determined by this number. The actual percentage is the inverse of this number. So if I want 100% of packets to be dropped at the max threshold, I would type in 1 divided by 100%, which is 1. For the exponential weight, I'm going to select 3 for the moment. But focusing on these first uh, numbers, well, what is going to happen is the Q level will increase to the point where the drop rate will be uh, such that just the right amount of percentage drop is applied to keep the Q level at about a constant uh, level. So here we have around uh, 28 approximately packets in the Q and at this level between 20 and 40 a drop percentage probability will be calculated. And it's calculated in two phases. First, there is a linear interpolation between zero and my max drop percentage. And then there's adjust an adjustment that's applied. And after those calculations happen, we get about um, a Q level of about, about 27 or 28 here. It, this is a uh, feedback loop. And this feedback loop um, calculates an average bit rate or actually an, a, an average uh, Q packet level using a um, infinite impulse response filter with an exponential weight. And the way this number works is that small values like zero cause the uh, rate limiter to use a feedback loop that is a little slower and more susceptible to noise. A larger value will smooth out the input Q rate and the uh, the input Q will rise a little faster to its final destination and it'll be a little more resilient to noise. Higher exponential weights like 6 or 9 will um, cause the Q level to rise faster but then it can overshoot and oscillate and settle down and typically values of 3 to 6 are um, ideal to use for random early detection. And finally, we, we can specify what happens to the input queue when this node is disabled. Right now I have it set to discard, which means that if I go up here and I disable the node, all the packets in the input queue will be discarded and not forwarded. And the other options are to send all the packets immediately in a burst or to send them as scheduled, in which case the packets may be intermingled with other packets that arrive after the node is disabled. And that pretty much covers the rate limiter. If I close it, you'll notice that the rate limiter is uh, not shaded, which means it's enabled. It has the orange asterisk, which means it has non-factory default. And if I hover the mouse over at top, it shows me some of the uh, most important uh, parameters, namely the uh, target rate, which I've set to 1 megabits per second.